All right, a couple of uh, notes before we get started here tonight. The first one being, if you weren't here last week or the week before, uh, the, the conversations surrounding love, sex, and dating that we're going through are not really meant to be culturally sensitive, meaning that the, the aim that we're taking is not that culture would nod along and say, we agree, we like it. More, yeah, because the problem is culture's doing a really poor job in this category. So it, it would seem to me a little bit strange if someone's track record was as poor as culture's is regarding the ideas of love, sex, and dating, where our marriage rates are actually plummeting, our divorce rates are increasing, our um, misunderstanding of self, the dysphoria that comes along with gender and identity issues is at an all-time high. The clip at which people your age are taking their own lives is 75% higher than the generation previous previous to you, I would just say the idea of being culturally sensitive is kind of a, it's a silly idea because what are we protecting? We're not really protecting anything worth protecting when we say we want to be culturally sensitive. I think if we were to do like a point counterpoint show on how culture is going, we would say culture does not just need a little bit of reformation, it needs a complete replacement. And so the idea surrounding this, it's meant to be subversive and it really gets down to this point of what do you have to lose, right? Being the most anxious and depressed and misunderstood generation of all time with, um, I mean, how many of us in here without a show of hands, just internally, we have so much frustration when it comes to the topic of sex and sexuality. And so many of us in this room are bound by addictions to pornography and sex addictions across the board. And while there was all this promise that the further we get away from this religious society of the 1900s and all the way back, dating back to the ancient church, uh, the, the further we get away from that, the more sexually liberated we're going to be and the freer we're going to be and the happier everyone's going to be. <laughs> that, didn't, that didn't go well, right? Like, that seems like we should get our money back on that proposal. And everything that was supposed to bring that liberation and that freedom, I, I think, it deserves now to come under scrutiny. And I think there should be an autopsy done of the death of this present idea of the self that is, that's kind of ruminating and, and pervasive in our culture. And so if you're here and your aim is to come in and see if this church is going to be culturally sensitive, the answer is unequivocally no, because we don't think that culture is working very well. Now, there's a very big difference between being culturally sensitive and sensitive to individuals, right? We want to, the, the scriptures, when it talks about individuals, it, it's the most bombastically upside down, historically speaking, document ever. This book gives power where there was no power before. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Tom Holland writes this book called Dominion. He's an atheist historian and he says the Bible alone is responsible for the reason that our culture celebrates the underdog why it celebrates those that culture had historically repressed why the movement from male patriarchy down into recognizing the masses as equal it's it's what Martin Luther King stood on with the creatorship of all of mankind to create equality and all these movements come out of this very subversive book right I was I, I teach a pre-marriage class and this week we we're doing the premarital course in Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ of the church, and husbands or, and wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Uh, and then submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And when you go through that, if I said which one of those is culturally insensitive, you would say the idea that women submit to their husbands is culturally insensitive, which is extremely ironic because when that was written in Ephesus 2,000 years ago, no one took beef with that section. But when Jesus said, Husbands, love your wives, that was wild. To tell a group of port authorities, this is Ephesus is a port city, so it's essentially ancient Las Vegas. So you came in and you were unknown, you were like, you were, you were anonymous. So you would come into port, you would sleep with whatever, whoever you wanted to sleep with, this is Ephesus. Then you left and no one knew and you went home and then you did whatever you wanted to do. So Paul writes to the church of Ephesus, all these men who are practicing this, and he says, from here on out, you will show true and loyal uh, fidelity to these women. You will love them. Not just a little bit, you're loving like Christ loved the church and laid himself and laid himself down for her by cleansing her with water and the word. And this is what got Paul, got his head cut off in Nero's circus. It was not the women going, feminism. It was the men going, leave us alone. Let us do our thing. We want to have our proverbial cake and eat it too. We want to have prostitutes and brothels and sex with temple um, insinuations of different expressions and pederasty and child sex slaves. And we want to follow Christ. And Paul said, this is not the case. 
What unity has the world with the way of Christ? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is who you used to be. You were immoral. You were idolater, uh, idolaters. You were adulterers. And this is who you once were, but you've been bought. You've been cleaned. You've been, there's been a high price paid for who you are. This is not you anymore. So Jesus, the idea that he would teach us, Jesus loved cultural insensitivity. Now, this is very different than being politically incorrect for its own sake. Jesus was never politically incorrect or culturally insensitive for the sake of cultural insensitivity, right? There's some political pundits on both the right and the left that they get the clickbait off of just being subversive to culture and rude about it and mean about it. And Jesus always matched, matched grace with truth. And so we want to do the same thing, but um, I, I'm not here to give you an idea of what you already know because you're in culture. Why would you come and hear a talk about sex and sexuality that goes right in line with what you've been force-fed and ivy dripped since the day that you were born? Why would you gather to hear that? If I just told you to, to give up an inkling of your cultural narrative regarding sex and sexuality, you would all say the same thing right? It's programmed into us. We almost naturally, when you start talking about second sexuality, all the anthems of our culture come into play. It's my body, my choice. I do whatever I want. The heart wants what it wants. You can't tell me who to love. These are all, you've been, I don't need to teach you that. Culture has taught you that. You spent 168 hours in a week, and for a lot of us, 167 hours of those week is spent in Babylon learning the ways of Babylon. Well, I'm not going to come in here and teach you about Babylon. You already know, but Jesus says there's a different way of being, there's a different way of learning. There's a different way of understanding. And if you just look at the statistics, what you'll find is sexual satisfaction rates, um, ideas of identity and comfort inside the human soul when it comes to sex and sexuality. Divorce rates plummet inside the church of Jesus to a remarkable extent. We're talking about a coin flip basically at 50% in culture down to anywhere around 17 to 23% depending on what poll you're doing. Not people who believe in God. I'm talking about church going people who have surrendered their life to Christ who can explain to you the gospel of Jesus. That number is remarkably low. So that's where we're, arg we're arguing from that position, from the position of we've tried what culture has to offer, it's not working. And inside of what Jesus says, there seems to be this very subversive idea that when it's practiced with regularity and it doesn't bow to culture and it's bold in saying this is how God designed it, it's working really well. So, th th but this is not, I mean, no one tied your hand to be in here with it, so you're free at any point to go, this is not what I wanted to hear, this, but, but just recognize this. If the God of the universe can't possibly agree with your definition or understanding of love, sex, and dating, then there's no such thing as God. You just have to recognize that. If God agrees with everything you think, if the Bible agrees with everything that you feel and all those things, th there's no such thing as God. You're, then, then you're the same thing as an atheist or you're an you're a, uh, autotheist. You yourself are God. If I run through, every time I open up scripture, if I run what the Bible says through my filter of, do I think this is true? and only accept the things that are, then, then he's not really God. Because Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9 says this. Jesus is speaking to us, and he says, My ways are not your ways, nor are my thoughts your thoughts, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are greater than yours. In other words, of course God's going to think things about love, sex, and, and dating, and sexuality, and homosexuality that are different than us. Why do you think the book's so long, man? Like, why do you think it's that many pages? It would just be one page if it agreed with us. It'd be like, yeah, you know. Do your thing. <laughs> it's this long because it fights against what Galatians 5, 19 through 21 says. It says that the, the ways of the flesh are contrary to the ways of the Spirit. So we have to train ourselves in the way of the Spirit because we are naturally disposed to the lust of the flesh. We have to, we have, to, we have, to have training in it. So this is not going to be for everyone, but I, I do want to help you with one thing that we're saying. We take a, and again, like, we're going to take a historical approach to the accurate Greek and Hebrew writing of the original first century text and the authorship therein, not progressive or deconstructed, but true to it. The cool thing about being at College Ave is people that sit in our pews, we don't have pews anymore, in our chairs on Sundays are the people who actually, like the head editor of the NIV Bible goes to our church. So he sits in a room of like a hundred Greek scholars and they argue over every word. At one point, there's a New Testament word called doulos, which is translated in the NIV as slave, 
but they spent two weeks arguing about which specific word to use. So the idea that Christianity has missed this idea for thousands of years, and someone on TikTok has finally found this new revelation, I think what you're going to find is one theologian once said, if it's true, it isn't new, and if it's new, it's probably not true. You're talking about scouring billions of people through every generation who have tested and tried the word of God. Your friend on TikTok didn't find something new. And it's the same text. We didn't, wait, we didn't find anything new. We found the Dead Sea Scrolls a few decades ago, and guess what? It's the same junk that we already had. It was like, look at all these new texts. It's the same thing we already had. Okay, fantastic. So, that's just to say, um, you're not going to offend me if you go, this is too far removed from what I understand to be right about the world. The second thing is we are going to take an historical approach to the teaching of the Christian scriptures through that lens, and I'm going to back it up, right? Like next week, we're going to talk about homosexuality. We're going to talk about the, um, what does God think about gay people? What, what does the scripture talk about when it talks about homosexuality and people who identify in different ways? And, and we're going to, but we're going to look at every argument for and against the idea of reinterpreting scripture to mean something for a new generation, it's going to be long. I'm going to tell you, it's going to be a lot more like a Bible study than it is going to be like a sermon. We're going to walk through the passages, the clobber passages of the Old Testament, the disputed ones of the New Testament, and come to a framework that I think, you don't have to agree with it, but at least recognize that this is what the Bible thinks about these certain topics. I hope to do so with grace. I hope to do so with love and understanding. But I, I'm kind of tired of, 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 of the church historically, not just in that category, but in every category of sexuality, being bullied into this idea that the world owns sex and the church needs to ask permission for culture if it's okay that we talk about these things when God is the inventor, procurator, definer, and adjudicator of sexuality. So it's really interesting. It's a really backwards way of approaching it. Or the church has to go, dear culture, who's blowing it in this category? Can we please talk about sex when God's going, I don't need your permission. Uh, this uh, Augustine, he talks about, he says, the, the word of God does not need to be defended. Like a lion doesn't need to be defended. Just open the cage, right? It, he's, he, he doesn't need our defense. But I, I, I do think that there's probably a generation or two of um, fearful pastors who have gone under the gamut and have been canceled and have kind of said, therefore, they relinquish and they withhold that. But then there's generations of people that are starving for actual truth and no one says anything because everyone's afraid of what culture says. So um, I, I know that I stand in this position and I'm in I'm freaking San Diego. So it's not like this is the <laughs> conservative capital of the world. I know that it's not, I recognize I'm standing in the middle of Babylon and saying there's a different way of thinking about things. But I think th the gospel is offensive to both the left and the right wing also. The gospel's offensive to, the, it has to be offensive to the Democrat and it has to be off offensive to the Republican. And if you think that Trump hung the stars or you think that Biden is a solution, you've, you've, you've forgotten the fact that no matter who sits as president, God sits as king. And no matter what happens, we submit to that. And, and so it, no matter what your ideology is, if you're a follower of Jesus, there's a time where you will need to leave your Republican ideology and you'll need to leave your liberal ideology and you'll need to reject the world and unite with the highway that is Christ. And if you can't do that, then you're gonna think that everything that I say needs to fit into your political or your conservative ideology and it's just not going to. Because Christ didn't come so that people would change their voting record from blue to red or red to blue, but that they would go from death to life and old to new. I don't know why that rhymed. It felt <laughs> that was not intentional, but sometimes the Holy Spirit, who is like Dr. Seuss, gets in there and it's like, <laughs> okay, so a little precursor in it. Um, that's kind of what we're walking through. Today we're talking about the idea, which was so um, commonly asked last week, which is what does it mean for us to date uh, to, to find kind of the right person to date, how ought we to date, and what, is the, what does cultural dating and hookup culture, what has it done to us, and what does the Bible have to say that's different? Again, for us to recognize that the way that your brain is wired, the way that your brain was originally constructed, is that people have, for thousands of years, up until 120 years ago, you were introduced to your spouse through your parental lineage or through your the, the community that you lived in, oftentimes on the day that you married that person. So the, the, the limbic reward system of your brain is actually wired as such for you to have a direct connection with someone really quickly. And when you begin to elicit ideas like deep conversations with the opposite sex and, and, and to break down those walls, there was a study that was done, I believe it was at Stanford about 20 years ago, and it was 10 questions. 10 questions, and they put people in a room, and they put, this, this was kind of a messed up part of it, but they put people of like, um, 
uh, beauty together. So they like rated them. It was Stanford, okay, I didn't do it. Uh, so they put like two tens, two nines, two eights, two sevens, two six, all the room. And first of all, what's crazy about that is they found each other, right? They like naturally went and they found people who were <laughs> of the same. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. But <clears throat> the second thing they did is they gave them a list of questions. And you can find these questions online. And the questions were essentially um, it, in this random blind survey study that they did. I'm going to get some of the numbers wrong, but it, it's remarkable nevertheless. Uh, in like these 10 couples, they had them ask really basic questions at first. And here was the only rules. You have to sit across from each other. At one point in the conversation, you have to break the touch barrier. But you have to ask these progressively more in, intimate questions as you go along. And they randomly put people in a room together and they had them ask these questions. And something like four out of the 10 couples got married. I'm going to say it one more time. <laughs> four out of the 10 couples, I don't know what percentage that is, but it's high, right? Got married. And at, I know it's 40. Everyone's easy. <laughs> yeah, okay. He's so stupid. He's so dumb. So what you'll find a lot of the times is your brain, why am I telling you that? Because your brain is wired to connect with who you tell it to connect with. It doesn't really know the difference between a good person in front of you that is suitable for marriage and a bad person in front of you that you would never introduce to your mom. If you keep eliciting these ideas and you walk into deeper intimacy with it, your brain begins to, to break down the walls between your frontal lobe, which is your decision-making part of your brain, and the other part of your brain, which is your oxytocin, vasopressin, delta vas B, all these other connecting chemicals. Your brain just goes, so this is the one? It must be the one. Who else asks these kind of questions while you're attracted to them? They must be the one. So they go, your brain like, has like this red alert button that's like, warning, warning, it's time. And so the floodgates of dopamine rush over your brain. You actually watch the brain synapses begin to rewire. And the attraction that you have, it, it, be, it, becomes, it comes onto this person. Not only that, that the female voice gets higher in pitch and the male testosterone increases up to like 40% inside of your system as you're talking to someone that you find attractive. The shoulders start to come back. Guys in a room in the same random sampling, their voice, their voice tone lowers, female voice tones higher and their shoulders get back. So people always ask me, they're like if a, guy, a bunch of guys are playing pickleball together and someone likes in, invites one female, I'm always like, it's a different pickleball game. And you don't get it, but it, that's the way that it works, right? Like, it's not that girls aren't fun to play pickleball with. It's that guys with girls around aren't fun to play pickleball with, right? You could play a game, there'd be no yelling or shouting for like an hour and a half. You bring one female and everyone's like, barbarism, like, I'm gonna murder you. <laughs> because it just, it changes dynamics, right? It's the way that we were built. So, as such, we have this really crazy power in order to kind of direct our brain to what we're going to be attracted to, right? This is where um, Dr. Flores de Apodaca was the guy who taught my human sexuality class in, in college, and he was, uh, he like worked for the, the Orange County Court of Appeals, and um, basically any kind of like violent sex crimes that were done, he was like a fetishist expert, which, what a strange occupation, right? They're like, this girl likes latex. <laughs> Dear Flores de Apodaca, please come in. This woman loves latex. So he's like, here I come. You know, like, what do we, so what do you do for a living? Well, um, do you like feet? I'm your guy. Uh, so he would come in, and, but he basically, he says like, whatever you begin to elicit, the sexual arousal process, whatever your brain is fixed on during that, you become addicted to and connected to. It's the way that God built us so that when we met someone and we started to marry them, that our brain would really quickly go, this is going to be the one. So you start to do things like the little annoying things that, you're, that you'll recognize this. If you're friends with someone who's dating someone remarkably annoying and you look at your friend and you're like, why does that not grade your senses? I would rather staple my face to the carpet <laughs> than listen to that person talk about life. And they're like, oh, he's so great. And I'm like, are you listening to the same thing I'm listening to? The answer is no, they're not. Because that, that co cosmic chemical cocktail of connection has now washed over their brain and things that we think are annoying, they think are adorable. <laughs> and then what happens? They break up and there's this disconnect and then all of a sudden they're like, they were kind of annoying, weren't they? And you're like, I've been telling you that for months. You're fighting against it. 
Proverbs 11, verse 14 to 15. Where there is no counsel, the people will fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. The, the power of that phrase is to recognize you're absolutely right. Because of that context, the Bible says shockingly little about dating. It says almost nothing about dating. It, it would be like if the Bible talked about screen time or the Bible talked about like calisthenic exercises or it talked about like AI and the limits that you should have on AI generation. It doesn't because that wasn't a thing. So what does the Bible say about dating? Nothing. It wasn't a thing. But it is a thing now. So you either go, well, the scripture has nothing to say about dating. Yes, it doesn't have anything to say about dating per se, explicitly and exclusively. But I think what Proverbs, Proverbs is saying right here is one of the cool parts about my job is I'm, uh, I'm, in a, uh, I'm getting my doctorate in, in, pa- in pastoral discipleship and counseling. So I'm in all these like cool classes where you like get to talk to people about psychology and things like that. But then as you're like teaching and mentoring couples that are pre-marriage and in marriage and divorce counseling, all that stuff, you hear the same patterns play out over and over and over and over again. And so I've gotten a chance then to talk to a lot of my other like young adult pastor friends or pastoral friends across the nation. And the cool thing about pastors in, in, in particular is they get to see so many patients and they get to see so many people come in their office and have these conversations. And so I basically ask them all this question. If you were to give advice to young adults about dating and life, what would it be? Because it's not, a lot of it's not biblical. It's grounded in biblical truths, right? In the, um, the appreciation of people, not as objects, but as humans to be loved, not people, not things to be used. It, it has these ideas that you're an image bearer of God. That all underpins everything, but there isn't like, it's not like first dating chapter five. There's not like a, bo- a book in here called like uh, the, <laughs> the Acts of the Dating Apostles where you like can watch what it was like to date. So you have to take some of those things, but there is something to be said about wisdom. And it, the, the companion of fools suffers harm, but someone who's got a multitude of counselors is able to walk in step. So th- the Bible is, is fraught with ideas about this. And so what I kind of wanted to do is I want to take years of both personal experience, but then also so many of, even if you're not a, a college ever, you don't go to, you're not here on the weekends, you don't call college ever your church home. I've gotten to speak to a lot of your pastors in this area and back up in North County and even around the country to say, um, what would you tell your former self when you were that age? What would you do if you were single right now? What would you do if you were a young adult? And I've kind of broken those things down into really simple things, and then I ran them through my mind, which is a scary place to be, but tried to uh, kind of formulaically deliver those in a way that t- trying to say, here's what a multitude of counselors would probably tell you right now on this topic. So next week we'll talk about homosexuality. The Bible has something very explicit to say about that. It does define it and does say that. Today we're going to talk about the idea of um, what does a healthy dating schema look like? What should our mindset be when we enter into one of those things? So that's what we'll be chatting on. To do so, I want to give you, uh, to start with, to, with recognizing that dating is not practice for marriage. Um, dating is, is practice for divorce, Okay. Dating actually trains us in all of the things that will never be helpful in your marital relationship. So if you think that you need to date around to get good at dating, that's false. If you think you need to date, or or sorry, if you date around to get good at marriage, that's not a thing. Um, That's like saying, I better work on my golf game so that I'm better at uh, math club. I, I don't even know if that's a thing. But you see what I'm saying? Those are actually non-overlapping magisterial authorities. They don't, they're not categorized in the same place. Dating doesn't teach you to be good at marriage. And I would also contend with this. A lot of people tell me, well, I got to date so I can find out what I like. And it's like, um, then you date someone and they cheat on you. And it's like, are you taking notes? I, I don't like it when people cheat on me. (laughs) Now that I know that, I can move forward. Like before you got in a relationship, you're like, I don't know, maybe cheating's fun. I don't know. Maybe I like it when people do that to me. It could be, I don't know. Right? Most of the things that we say when we're dating, it's, it's like what drunk people say. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But the brain that like we talked about last week, the, the brain in love is the same as the brain that's drunk. 
And it actually does the same thing. It does it in sections, right? Your, did you know your brain gets drunk in sections? Your brain starts with right here, which is your frontal lobe. When you start drinking alcohol, the first thing that gets impaired is your decision-making part of your brain, which is why when you start the night and you're like, I'm going to have one drink. The problem is the first thing that goes bye-bye when you drink is the thing that says I'm only going to have one drink. That thing's like, forget it. Like, why not two? So... <laughs> After that, then it goes, it goes back, and as it keeps triggering, you get like your occipital lobe, and you get like your prefrontal cortex, and, your, and as it does that, your brain actually moves. All the things you see, your friend who's progressively drinking more and more, it's because parts of their brain are becoming intoxicated. So after the, after the frontal lobe comes in, then it keeps moving back towards the back of your brain, and then the next part of your brain's in charge of gross motor functions, which is why you get, or sorry, fine motor is first, which is why you don't, <laughs> you ever seen someone that drunk texts, and you're like, that's not English right there, because it's like, I don't, I don't know what I'm saying, I don't know, and then the next part is gross motor functions, which is why you get people who are walking the street, like, I'm fine, right, girls in their high heels here at SDSU, that's my favorite, when they're walking down the street, they're like, hi, hi, now, why would you drink that much and wear high heels, right, that's why after a while, they just become self-aware. They're like, okay, okay. We're j I'm still, okay. Then it's like your gross motor functions. And then if you continue to get drunk, it affects your occipital lobe, which uh, your occipital lobe is responsible for things like light and dark and seeing. This is why you can get like blurry vision. And eventually, your brain as a way of protecting you from drinking too much and killing you will make you black out. So it, it literally says, shut the system down so this fool stops drinking. And so you, uh, that's your brain, that's your brain's kill switch so you don't die. Because the next part of your brain to get drunk is your midbrain or your snake brain, right? And that's responsible for things like heartbeat, brain function, oxygenation of your bloodstream. If that gets drunk, you're dead. So your brain has ways of protecting itself, but when you get drunk, it's that kind of that same limbic reward process. So what, that's why when you find someone who, drinks on a regular basis, what you'll find is they build a tolerance to it. The real thing that we mean when we say tolerance is that they've tricked the limbic reward system of their brain, which always needs more of the same thing to be satisfied. This is hard to explain. Okay, I'm going to need help. Um, I need to figure something out. Okay, here, this is, this is this microphone, okay? And this is a music stand. <laughs> this is science. Okay. So this is your brain, and your, in your brain you have these things called dopamine receptors. Okay? These are dopamine receptors. Woohoo! Now, over here, this is um, the <laughs> um, can, can you come, just come up here? Okay. And, um, uh, Lauren, sorry, I know you don't want to. You knew I was going to call on you. Yeah, okay, come on up here. Okay, so you guys are going to be dopamine, okay? And these are your dopamine receptors, okay? So we're going to start with only having one dopamine receptor. This is how your brain actually works. This is why if you've ever been confused about why people around you drink and smoke, or you yourself, your addiction to pornography, whatever it is, you go, why is it so all-encompassing? Why does it... Why does it have me in bondage? This is how your brain works. So when your body is meant to reward you for progressive activities that are supposed to be part of your maturation process, right? So the biggest hits of dopamine you're ever going to get in your life is in orgasm, is in the procreation of children, is in seeing your kid for the first time. It's, it's all these things that your, your brain is meant to reward you for doing something positive in your life, okay? So if you're successful on a test, your brain goes, whoop, a little bit of dopamine, just this little drop of dopamine, secretes across your brain, but that doesn't actually feel good. Dopamine doesn't create a good feeling in you or a sense of accomplishment until a dopamine receptor goes, that's the eating sound of a dopamine receptor. So, right, you're playing soccer and you've worked really hard and the payoff of that that your brain says is as soon as I score a goal, you score and it goes bloop and here comes your dopamine and then nom nom nom. And when that happens, your brain goes, your body goes, whew, that felt good, okay? One bit dopamine, one bit dopamine receptor. That is called a balanced brain. And God built our brain for balance and not chaos. So what happens is, what's your name? Quentin. Quentin. Quentin and Lauren are up here. And so Quentin, let's say in his life, he is a soccer player. Do you play soccer? Not so much. <laughs> World of Warcraft? Okay. What do you do? What's like your thing? I need coffee. 
You make coffee? Okay. I don't even like coffee, so let's see how this goes. <laughs> okay. Um, so Quentin plays soccer, and, <laughs> and as such, Quentin works really hard, and he disciplines himself in all these things. He's got a great day of practice, and he goes, and he finally scores a goal in the game. So Quentin is a dopamine. He's, re he's secreted. He goes, and he go right here. You're by your dopamine receptor. And as, as, as soon as that happens, his brain goes, oh, this is the feeling of reward. This is what everyone knows when they have that good feeling, that, or like a, a marathon, like a runner's high. So hey, Quentin, you can go back over there. But here's what happens. When you begin to participate in illicit activity, the reason we use the word illicit is because it elicits fake dopamine or pseudo dopamine. So the things that are supposed to bring, it's supposed to be difficult to secrete dopamine because it's supposed to be bound, as it were, in these things that are actual accomplishments. So when you smoke or drink or do another illicit activity, whatever it might be, right? Like I drink as an adult. I, I drink socially. I'm not getting plastered, which is well within my right inside of scripture. So it's all contained in those things. But what you'll find is some people, let's say you take to, I don't know, whatever you do. Let's, let's, let's use pornography as an example, okay? So in orgasm is one of the most incredible uh, releases of dopamine that human experiences, but it also releases oxytocin and serotonin and all these things that your brain basically looks around itself and goes, hold on, what just made that happen? What, wh why are we releasing these chemicals in the brain like Delta Fos B, all these connecting chemicals, so it searches for whatever kind of created that habit, wh what created that orgasm. So it looks at what you're looking at and it goes, okay, I guess we'll connect to images on a screen, I guess we'll connect to endless novelty, I guess we'll, and so this, the seeking mechanism of pornography actually becomes part of the process itself of arousal. So it's not just the, it's not just the, the moment of orgasm, it's the search for it. Your brain starts telling, oh, we got to gear up, we got to get ready, we're about to receive a great reward. But Quentin, in his life, is supposed to have found a woman, courted her, asked for a hand in marriage, gone through the whole process, and then he should be secreting that. But instead, he skipped the process whoosh, and just said, I'm going to start eliciting this dopamine whenever I feel like it, however I feel like it. So, Lauren and Quentin, when instead of doing it accurately, he's going to overwhelm his senses so that instead of releasing one-bit dopamine to one-bit dopamine receptor, when he starts eliciting false dopamine, he's going to send this wave, this kind of, you guys can both go over there, this kind of tidal wave of dopamine, and his brain's kind of going, what did we just get rewarded for? And it's looking at the screen and going, interesting. Well, we should get used to this because it seems like this is happening quite often. So if we're going to be given two shots of dopamine on a regular basis, we don't, want, we don't want to be overwhelmed on a regular, uh, on a regular time scale. And so, you're, so God has built your brain in order to adapt. And to, it's neuroplastic. So you guys can go back over there. So after, the, after orgasm happens, after the whole kit and caboodle is done, as Quentin sleeps at night, his brain goes, right? There's a, you know, it's like inside out. The guy's in his brain like, all right, gentlemen, we were overwhelmed, but we will not be overwhelmed again. What is our strategy? What's our game plan? Well, your brain strategy and game plan is always the same. Make more dopamine receptors. So your dopamine receptors actually can multiply. So Quentin's brain goes, ha, 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 ha. You're not going to overwhelm us again. We're not going to be fooled with all this dopamine. So then he participates in the same activity as before. The sa and so in the arousal process, he's thinking about it. He's working towards it. And he finally has that same experience of arousal and orgasm. And then here they come back over there. Yay, there you go. One on one, one on the other. And now Quentin goes, hold on. Before, it was two bits dopamine to one bit dopamine receptor, and I had an overwhelmed feeling. This doesn't feel so overwhelming. My brain's adjusted. It's synced. It has neuroplastically transformed itself, and the synapses have been rewired so that I'm no longer overwhelmed. So Quentin goes back home, or wherever he was to, when this happened, right? And he thinks to himself, I need to overwhelm this again. You see, this is where the limbic reward system is bondage. Because it begins to tell you, mm, that was okay. 
That was like when we used to score goals in soccer, right? Yeah, one to one, one bit to one bit, that was great. But remember what, the, what it felt like when we first started to illicitly secrete those things and we kind of tricked our brain into sending reward when we didn't have any reward that we should have sent? That was great. So Quentin begins to search for a new novelty. So he might look up a version of pornography that he hasn't before, or it might move from um, metaphysical to physical. He might hire somebody. He might do something. I'm sorry, Quentin, I'm not talking about you, but um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Quentin applied for internship for next year, so we'll see how this goes. And <laughs> so as such, Quentin's brain goes on a mission to have that same feeling that it was felt when it was overwhelmed, but Quentin knows that it, it's the definition of insanity to, to repeat the same thing and expect a different response. So he begins to tell himself, that's not going to work. I need something new. So he starts looking at stuff that he hasn't looked at before or a new genre of pornography he hasn't looked at before. Maybe it's, maybe it's uh, um, he, he actually has to insert some pattern of actually violent behavior inside the pornography or maybe it's multiple partners or maybe it's some sort of three-dimensional interaction or again, maybe he kicks from what is metaphysical to going and participating in what is physical. Maybe he participates in some kind of um, uh, activity of hiring a prostitute or an escort or something else like that because his brain is, is pushing him to seek something new. And if you've had an addiction before, none of this is wild to you, right? No one sitting here who's had an addiction to drugs or alcohol or sex or anything that elicits false dopamine is sitting here going, I don't recognize this process. Most of us recognize this perfectly because what happened before was this overwhelming sensation, which is now nothing more than what you used to do when you... <laughs> You're not done. Whose kid is this? <laughs> so what happens is now, if let's say they go and uh, he has another experience that's you know kind of wild, and he has to pretend there's a third person up here. You don't need to move that. You guys can go sit down. I guess we've we've understood at this point. You've done great. So what what can happen this time is let's say there's three bits. Yay, walking. Okay. So he participates in some new behavior. And now there's three bits dopamine, and it goes back over here, and Quentin goes, yes, that's what I've been missing. This must be what it is. I must have needed that. I must have needed this next level. Or he connects to something that um, he, he, he combines both sexual arousal with something that in his mind or historically has been taboo for him. He needs both the expression of sexuality and the taboo nature of the sexuality combined. And then it morphs slowly into different things until it continues to build. And now, when Quentin goes to play soccer, and he's got now three bits dopamine receptors because he keeps practicing this illicit activity that is falsely... That's the word of God. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for everyone. Um, if he goes back to play soccer, what happens? He scores a goal, and it's like, yay. And all three dopamine receptors have to share one bit dopamine, and they all go, um... Could we go back to what we were doing last night? Could we go back to what was eliciting more than this? This really isn't kicking it for us anymore. And that's why you find for some of you, it's fathers, it's mothers, it's people in your household, it's uncles, it's aunts, who you've watched through this process of alcoholism or drug addiction or dependency or whatever it is, have you, you've watched them and you kind of go like, why don't you want to hang out with me anymore? How could you possibly leave your family? But in their brain, they have a one-track mind overwhelm the dopamine receptors and it's primal and it's carnal to continue that process over and over and over again. And that's why when you're walking down, right, like San Diego, you recognize it. You walk down like downtown San Diego and you see these people like talking to themselves and what just kind of crazy behavior because every time they get a lot of them, not all of them, right? I'm, I'm using, but I, I think the tune is like 90% of the transient population has some form of mental disorder brought about by chemical dependency and addiction, right? So when you start to study the idea of missiology, even in, a, in an urban setting, what you're gonna recognize is that as this process has played itself out for so many people, no one starts on day one by going like, you wanna know what I want? I want like these abscess marks all over my body. I want to not remember who I am. I wanna wind up in a ditch. I wanna be consistently and consummately used by people for their sexual arousal just so I can have my next hit of crack or my next methamphetamine. No one starts day one going, who's got meth, right? Most people don't. Most people start that 
when the, the processes they had before just aren't cutting it anymore, they continue more and more illicit until finally they go, oh, this works, but then it's not just a little, it's gotta be a lot. Now it's not just a lot, it's gotta be more than that. And this is the limbic reward system. This is why in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Jesus says, you might think that everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything's permissible, you say, but you must not be mastered by anything. This is the process of mastery that is concocted in the human brain where when the fall of humanity happened, God, who built us to be addicted to himself, we now began to elicit this supply of dopamine that was not meant for our temporal world or our temporal nature, and we find ourselves becoming addicted to things, to substances, to alcohol, to behaviors, to sexual uh, deviances, and the reason that so often uh, people who are practicing sexuality, it's, uh, when I say practice sexuality, I mean like practicing sexual deviant behavior, there's no real stop to it because their brain's telling them we need more of the same thing in order to experience a similar arousal. That's why we should have deep grace for people who are experiencing, it's literally, it's a disease. Alcoholism is a disease. Chemical dependency addiction is a disease. What's a disease? It means it, it, it actually has a neurological, but also a mechanical transformation of the brain. You can see an addicted brain. It's not just in their thoughts. It's not just a, a matter of not being able to overcome or the willpower to, to supersede. It, it, it's a, you can see it on a brain scan that their brain has changed. Now they're fighting the fact that they've got all these freaking dopamine receptors and nothing in their life brings them pleasure. Nothing. How could someone turn to prostitution? How could turn, someone turn to this? Because they have taught to disassociate with their body because their body is just a vessel by which they get more in terms of their brain. That's why the, the scripture, when Jesus interacts with people, like the, the, the woman caught in adultery or the prostitute, everything, he has such deep grace for this because he recognizes how the human machine is made and that while they have chosen, in some cases, these different activities, it then becomes habitual and that habitual uh, nature becomes a disease that they need help with, which is why it's so beautiful that Jesus has programmed our brain in such a way that we can have synaptogenesis. Your brain can get rewired. If you stop using dopamine receptors, you know what happens to them? They die. If you stop this process, your brain starts to, in the same way that it was overwhelmed, it says, you're gonna keep feeding me one bit dopamine and I've got 16 dopamine receptors. So after one week, it goes, we don't need 16, let's do 15. We don't have 15, we need 14. We don't need 14, we need 13. We don't need 13, we need 12. And it kills them one by one. Until one day, when someone who has finished the process of their brain being addicted to something or their body going through withdrawals of not having that thing, it's their, brain, it's their body punishing them for not feeding it the subscribed amount of dopamine, you go, Dad, you're back. Or your friend who is in addiction, it's, you're back. Because they're not caught up in the constant desire and seeking of that dopamine again to satisfy what in their life used to be fun for them. So when they stop going out with you because they're going to go do something else, that's why. When they start rejecting, but the, see, the thing, I don't really know where this goes, Josh, so I'm just gonna put it places, and then you can change it to put it other places. It's the beauty of having a mobile setup. And, but to recognize that this is what your brain does, and this is what we tell it to do when we start dating someone. When you start dating someone, your brain goes through a very similar process, which is why I remember, um, like when I went on my first date with Carolyn, which is April 21st of last year, there was like this, you're, you're talking about stuff, it's getting like more intense to think, well, when you've got five kids, you don't really have like a first date. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, do you want kids? I do, actually. I, <laughs> I have five. Um, right, and she knew my story and everything. So, but you know, when you're having those first conversations and your first dates, right, where you're like, I'm gonna go hold her hand, and you like psych yourself up for it, you're like, oh, could you hold this for me? I got, and love, right? Like, <laughs> that one's free, write that down. <laughs> and, right, like, why, why do all those, why are all those things so, in our mind, it almost gives us the same hit that later on in relationships, sexual experiences give, why? Because it's, we're overwhelming that part of our brain that's not used to that. But now, when, like, we're in church this morning, and my wife holds my hand. I'm not like, well, <laughs> hi. It's just like, whatever. 
because it happens over and over again. So think about the tools you need to serial date. If you want a serial date, here's, the tool, here's what we're training our brains to do. Guard your heart, recover quickly, appear okay, make another person jealous, play games, play hard to get, and distance ourselves from helpful community and counsel. This is what we teach ourselves to do in a serial dating context. N- nothing that I just said, to guard your heart, recover quickly, appear okay, make other people jealous, play games, play hard to get, distance ourselves from helpful counsel and community, none of that is beneficial in a, in a marriage context. Not a single part of it. But when we find someone, right, if you're like, you know, Taylor Swift or whoever, John Mayer, I don't even, oh, I guess they dated, but <laughs> go figure. They, they're like, oh, I'm good at dating, right? I can get up, and then I can drop them, and then Beyonce is like, to the left, to the left, everything you own in a box to the left, right? You're like, get him, girl, you told him. That's not helpful in marriage. If you carry that on into marriage, and you're like, you must not know about me, I'm I don't date, everyone in my world's replaceable. You are not irreplaceable. That's the opposite of marriage, right? When you say I do, you're going, in my life, you're irreplaceable. (laughs) I'm never gonna tell you where your things are so you can go pick them up on your way home. I'm not gonna try to make you jealous, right? This is, these are games that fools play. They are not, it's not the stuff of healthy marriages. So, in a different context, we have to recognize that one of the ways that our brains, it's really, have, we have a hard time coping with this. If you've never dated anyone, some of this is going to be slightly foreign, except you've seen it all over. And some of us have dated so much, right? I was part of that serial dating community in like high school and early college. I didn't really date as much as I just waited until someone got interest, a girl got interested in me, and then I walked away like, whoa, he must have been reading my signals all wrong, which they weren't, right? But it's just like, <laughs> when you're throwing all these crazy, especially as Christian guys, you're like, oh, I'm sorry, I just wanted to hang out with you and ask you questions about your dad. I didn't know that meant that we were serious. It's like, <laughs> what? Are you dumb? <laughs> I can say it to myself now, because now I think that's categorically stupid, okay? Um, but there's so many things that we believe when we're dating, and we're not going to let you tell us any differently. And I know that some of you aren't going to listen to anything that I say until you become my age, right? It's like when I, when I, when I was, I was probably like 21 years old. And I would have said like my best, my three best friends, two were guys and one was a girl. And my pastor at the time was like, um, real guys don't have girl best friends. And I said, oh. <laughs> yes, they do. And he just basically told me, he goes, I don't even know why you're pouring this relationship because one day it's going to die. And I'm like, no, I'm going to date a woman. I'm going to marry a woman who understands. That's not a thing, <laughs> right? Never once have I been like, Paige, I just, I've had a hard week. I'm going to go hang out with Vanessa and see what she thinks about stuff. It's just, it's not a thing. And guys in the back that are married, how many female best friends do you have? Zero? Scott? Negative? <laughs> that's, that's cool. Rachel? Uh, male best friends? It's not just that they don't, it's that I can't explain to you a mature, respectful Christian man who would ever let the words escape his mouth, I'm gonna go hang out with my best friend, and her name is, I would go, everyone around would go, what did you just say? It just doesn't make any sense, right? That relationship must come to an end, and so his wisdom was right. I don't know why I'm pouring into this. Now, you might have friendships, your, your communities you hang out with, But as far as the people who know your soul the best, it is dangerous, right? And I didn't recognize that. And I wouldn't have believed if you told me. Just like some of you are going, you don't understand. Kevin's the best. Okay. (laughs) I get it. But in 10 years, when you have got three kids, and you're going, well, maybe not three kids. Don't get crazy. But (laughs) I think you'll recognize, ah, the tools of dating and the tools of marriage aren't the same tools. And the sharper your tools of dating get, it actually dulls the tools of marriage and vice versa. One doesn't compliment the other one. One is hurtful towards the other one. Which is why when you're dating, you want to date less like a shotgun and more like a sniper, right? You don't want to go, well, let's see. <laughs> you don't need to see that much because most of us recognize already what we want and what we don't want. Okay, so I think sometimes we make that argument. But anyway, the, the one way that we have learned how to cope with the disappointment of broken and failed relationships is not to take responsibility for them. It's that we've learned these titles from like the DSM 4, 5, and 6, the the psychosocial health and wellness uh, books, textbooks on what creates these problems, and we've just begun to categorize all of our exes in terms of their their what? Their, Their dysfunctions. Like, he was a narcissist. 
Heman, Heman's history, she had histrionic personality disorder. He was borderline. And some of these things can actually be true and can be clinical, but what, what's happened, I think, is in an effort to make palatable the failures of our own relationships, we just go, uh, why, uh, why, why is everyone that I date a narcissist? The question you need to ask yourself is, why do you attract narcissists? The problem is, whenever you run over your former boyfriend or girlfriend with a car, you have to be responsible with answering the question, how did they fool someone like you for that long, right? So there's a sense in which we have to take responsibility and go, I didn't see any of this coming. I didn't recognize. Now, can people flip a switch and be crazy over it? For sure. But in most cases, that's not what took place. In most cases, there were warning signs, and our friends tried to tell us, and our mom tried to tell us, and our dad tried to explain it, and we ran through all of them because of love, right? <laughs> and the more people tell us to stop, the more we feel like we're synonymous with Romeo and Juliet. We're like, this makes sense because the Capulets and the Montagues are all hated, right? And that's not you. It's just loving people trying to give you wisdom. So we've just kind of said this categorically. Let me give you this statement as we are kind of wrapping up here and, and take a couple of questions. Um, th this is, uh, people sent these things into me from all over the country, and I, I made this little rhyme scheme because I keep getting asked the question, how do I know if someone that I'm interested in is ready for marriage? How do I know that someone I'm interested in is here to not serial date, but is here to move into courtship, into a marriage relationship? And at least moving towards it. I don't think that every relationship needs to end in marriage, but no relationship should start unless it's moving towards marriage, right? Like, in, in, uh, what I mean by that is you're not going to know whether it's moving towards marriage until you're in the relationship. I get that. But you should never be dating anyone that you go, nah, never. But let's try it out, right? That doesn't make it. Because if you say, I really, really shouldn't, but I'm just going to give them a shot, but they have all your non-negotiables are things that they don't have, what happened when you sit in a room with someone and start asking them intense questions? Your brain starts to connect to them. So that's why you gotta be careful who you go on a date with because what you'll find is that your brain starts to look at the maladies and the annoyances and the idiosyncratic problems and it starts to go, I kinda like these things. These are kinda nice. And your friends are gonna go, oh no, she's drunk, her brain's gone, and she's like, not even, everyone's against us. Like that's, <laughs> that's like the motto of codependent relationships. Baby, don't listen to them. They all want us to fail. What? <laughs> Honestly, people are so self-involved, they don't really care that much about you to want you to have a relationship fail. So if they offer you advice, it's probably only once, and it's probably like, you should probably break up. And when you say no, they're like, whatever, I'll move on. Because it's just, no one wants to fight against a drunk person. No one wants to fight if you're categorically going, you don't understand us, you don't understand us. Why do I know what that sounds like? Because I said it. You know how many times I told people, you don't understand or your love's too immature, and you don't have what we have, Dad. Anyway. <laughs> we'll share this on our uh, thing, but number one, check the shackles on their wrists. This is gonna rhyme. That's why it's gonna sound like this. Check the shackles on their wrists. What does it mean? It means the, one of the ways that, one of the key ways you're gonna know if someone's ready for marriage is that they're free. If you're not free, you're not ready for marriage. What does free mean? Free from these things. Free from other relationships. Right? You don't have inappropriate, you're not following in inappropriate accounts on Instagram. Guys, do you know that girls look at that? If a, tell me I'm lying. <laughs> tell me. If you're interested in a girl, she will click on your profile, she will go to people that you follow, and she will look for any blue check marks Instagram influencer with no clothes on and go, uh, no. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Guys, ladies especially, if I say something that you connect, just give me a mm, because I want to make sure the guys know I'm not up here just spewing stuff. I, mm. okay. <laughs> that they're not keeping up with old relationships. They don't have a reason to make sure that their old boyfriend is doing well. It's not important anymore. Codependency masquerades itself as affection. Codependency's favorite outfit, favorite Halloween costume, is love. Codependency's favorite mask is affection. It masquerades as affection, but it's not. It's codependency. 
So free from other relationships, free from inappropriate, following inappropriate, free from other past relationships. Number two, on that freedom, the free from addictions. They're free from, guys, this is important. Ask them, what is your relationship to pornography? At least make them lie to your face. Carolyn asked me that on our second date, and I, because she would ask me dumb questions. She was like, I'm like, we'll get married, and you'll find that all out. She's like, what's your favorite color? I'm like, I don't care. What does this matter, right? <laughs> Who would play you in a movie about your life? <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> and then she said, what's your relationship to pornography? And I went, there's a good question. That's what, if I, you were my daughter, that's what I would send you on a date asking. What's your relationship to pornography? And would you be comfortable with me checking your Instagram history right now and your social media? Could I check it right now without any problems, right? And the way that um, manipulators shift that is to make it a problem of your trust, not a problem of their infidelity. Well, why don't you trust me? Because you're not trustworthy, Ben, okay? <laughs> It, whenever my wife picks up my phone to go text someone or do something or go online or whatever, I should be able to go, here's my, pa she already knows my password, but go, look whatever you want. Search through the history, okay? Um, free from addictions, okay? Uh, number three is on the freedom thing. Free in their identity in Christ. Not over-concerned with what people think. Have, they live in a transcendent reality. They're not sitting here collecting scorecards from the world all the time. Free. Check the shackles on their wrists. Are they free? Number two, check the truth that's on their lips. So check the shackles on their wrists. Are they free? Check the truth that's on their lips. What does it mean? Um, don't, it, someone calling themselves a Christian means nothing. It means nothing, right? The term Christian is qualified almost not at all in Scripture. And it was a term that was used derogatorily towards early Christ followers, which meant little Christ people. The term Christian can mean anything. You can be a Christian Buddhist, you can be, but the questions if you really want, not a real Christian Buddhist, right? But the idea is, when you're asking someone if they're, if they're a Christian, half the world identifies as Christian. But if you ask the world, do you believe that the Bible is the final authoritative word of God? It's a very different answer. So when you're asking these questions, check the shackles on their wrists, check the truth that's on their lips. Do you believe the Bible is the final authority of faith and morality? Here's a test I like to give. Here's what I will tell people to ask their significant other. To say, I want you to go up to them and I want you to say, hey, and I say, pick, the, pick whatever infraction you want, okay? Um, well, the Bible says that I can't do this, but I've been praying about it a lot lately and I just feel a peace that God's given me special permission to be okay in this category. What do you think? And listen to what they say. Because if they go, oh, sounds like God's good with it. You go, no. The Bible is the final authority of faith and morality, not your internal emotions during prayer time. Don't you know that the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond repair? Jeremiah 17, verse 9? That's what you say. <laughs> Check the shackles on their wrists. Are they free? Check the truth that's on their lips. Do they profess to be a follower of Christ or are they actually following Jesus? Number three, uh, check their reputation twice. Check the shackles on their wrists. Check the truth that's on their lips. Check their reputation twice. Here's a question. Who that you admire admires them? Who that you admire admires them? Does their reputation precede them positively or negatively? And if it's negative, people can change, but you need to ask, here's what I've heard about you. Tell me why that's different. Tell me what changed and what's different about you now. And if they go, well, you don't understand. That was last week and this is this week. That's not a good reason, right? Check their reputation twice. Ask people about them and that their worth is found in Christ. Would they be okay if you weren't in their life? You wanna know, is your worth found in Jesus? Is your satisfaction found in Christ? Is your identity planted in him? Because if not, and you cling to me, I'm going to disappoint you, because whatever you idolize, you'll ultimately demonize. Whatever replaces God in your heart, when it fails you, you'll hate. It happens every time. Whatever you idolize, you'll ultimately demonize. Check the shackles on their wrists. Check the truth that's on their lips. Check their reputation twice and that their worth is found in Christ. And then just a little phrase to help it, make, to help it rhyme. 
And though they're not who they will be, seek teachable humility. That's the last one, teachable humility. What's their relationship with the word sorry? What's the difficult time that they've gone through? How do they resolve conflict? Do they have a good record of walking through difficulty? Uh, if I went and I applied for a surgeon's job with a fake resume and I, I talked jargon, you prob I could probably convince you that I was a surgeon. Say words like Johns Hopkins, coagulate, hemorrhage, embolism. You put me in the operating room and you'll find out real quick, homie's not a surgeon. In the same way, you don't want to know how someone acts on the mountaintop. You want to know who they become in the valley. Because the majority of your marriage will be not fought on the mountaintop. It will be found in the valley and in the stasis and in the summit and in the everyday and in the mundane. So if you only experience them on the mountaintops, congratulations, you now know what they're going to be like in about 3% of your marriage. <laughs> Wrapping up, check the shackles on their wrists, check the truth that's on their lips, check their reputation twice and that their worth is found in Christ. And though they're not who they will be, leave room for the fact that God's still turning them into something. They don't need to be the perfect father before they've ever had kids, right? They're learning, they're growing, but you should seek teachable humility. Tim Keller said, I want a good chunk of marble to date my daughter. Someone willing to be crafted by the creator to turn them into something great. Teachable humility. I'm gonna, I'll bring the band up. I got to about half of what I wanted to get to, but here we are. Um, let me take a couple questions as we wrap up. How does dopamine neuroactivity impact sex within marriage? This is a great question. When you haven't taught your brain to be attracted to novelty or to new, it'll become attracted to whoever you say, I do to. That also rhymed, right? Um, so when your brain doesn't know any differently, it doesn't know that whoever you're married to is bad at sex, possibly. It doesn't know. Because the dopamine that is secreted when you're having sexual intercourse with the person that you're married to, or other things, oral sex, whatever it is with the person that you're married to, what's elicited there is protected in the confines of marriage because that's available to you at all times. Christian marriage operates differently. There isn't this idea of like women are gatekeepers and they keep men out. It's, it's like there's this mutual giving to one another inside of marriage. It's a beautiful thing. So it, it doesn't break the limbic reward system. It feeds it appropriately. The same amount of dopamine is secreted through these things because you're not practicing new novelty. But that's also why you don't invite other people into your bedroom. You don't invite pornography into the bedroom of a healthy marriage. You don't invite any extracurricular thing into the bedroom when you're married. It's the two of you. Because then you're never caught in the situation where you go, well, that was good, but that was great. Now every night, instead of just her, I need that other thing too. So you're protecting your limbic reward system in there. Good question. <laughs> where do I find these people? Okay. <laughs> uh, let me step on some toes real quick. You're like, oh, you're going to start now. But... I'm filtering, and I'm deeply loving you, and I'm trying to let you know, um, if you come to me and you say, Christopher, where is there a girl that you trust that you would think would be great for me to take on a date? I'm gonna look at the people around College Avenue Church who are serving in ministry. That's the first place I'm always gonna look because they put their money where their mouth is. They're here, they're serving, they're loving everyone else. They're not just going and seeking. They're not church hopping, just finding the next group that they can go and find a mate in. They're secure in themselves. And you wanna know what else is wild about that? Is all the old women in the church who have sons and grandsons and they think about these girls too and they're like, I've got a girl for you. Like the, these women are crazy. These like older women, they're always like, come here, gotta meet my son. And the son's like, you know, a NASCAR driver. You're like, this is great because grandmas are powerful, right? <laughs> so, uh, I would say um, do follow what Christ has called you to do in whatever context he's called you to do that. I think one of the issues that I have systematically with like the young adult population, which is my deep love for you, is that so many people come up to me and go, I don't feel intimacy with God. I don't feel connection. I don't know where to find anyone. But, but then again, when I say, well, are you doing the things that scripture has asked you to do in the local church? There's almost a categorical and universal no. 
So you're not serving, you're not giving, you're not connected, you're not in community, you're not giving of yourself, you're not laying down your life, you're not serving one another, you're not loving one another, you're not connected to the body, you're not under reproach from an elder board, you are not undertaking biblical responsibility of your connection to any church. So it's really hard to go, how would I ever expect to lose weight when everything in the weight loss plan I'm refusing to do? You can't come, I don't feel connected to God. He's given you 18 ways to do it, and we go, well, I want the connection without any of the work. Discipline of self is gonna lead to that. So I, that's part of my soapbox. And I'm just assuming a lot of you guys are here, you probably have home churches that you're serving at, doing that stuff at. So I'm not, I know that so many, this is like a supplemental ministry to you. That's okay, I don't think it's a problem. There's no such thing as too much Bible teaching. But that you are connected somewhere to a local body where you are not just being poured into, but that you're pouring into other people. That you are, the book of Titus says, I'm receiving mentorship from above, but I'm also then imparting it to people that need it below. And I think that's an essential part of it. So where would you find it? Um, I would say start by doing what Christ has called you to do and then look around you. Because those people are of the same mind. So come and ask me. This is the first thing I'm going to point you to. So (laughs) If you're serving one of our children's ministries here and you're a young lady, I'm sorry, but I'm just going to point everyone towards you and go, <laughs> here they are. <laughs> Yay, okay. Last one. Um, this one's so rough. It's so good. How come I can't create dopamine receptors to make me like the opposite gender? Ugh. It's such a good question. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit more next week, which actually is a great segue into that, but I just, it, it just like, there's such a, just feels like it's such a heart filleted open in that question of going like, why does it feel like God is faithful to all you people who are operating inside of what scripture talks about, but here I am trying everything that I can to try to create these connections to this, and it just, it just feels like my body's incapable of doing so. And I just wanna let you know, like you're, you're not the only one here who feels that way. You're not the only one here who struggles with same-sex attraction. You're not the only one here who would identify as gay. You're, not, you're, you're by no means the only soul here who feels in that context. And I think that that's a really great way of segueing us into, into next week, but also just to recognizing that one time someone asked me, if you could only categorize God in one way outside of his holiness, what would you do? And I would say that the word would be redemption. And, and that word redemption is so powerful, especially in the context of, of sexuality. But for a lot of people, every bit of your natural self self-expression in a sexual context seems to be outside of, of bounds in terms of the Christian scriptures. Um, and I, here's what I think. I, I think the church has done a pretty lousy job connecting with people who identify in that way while not um, just kind of shoving them into these preconceived molds of what needs to be. And I think we need to do a better job as it were. But next week we'll talk about maybe a little bit what underpins some of that frustration and to let you know that, who, I don't know who wrote that, but whoever it is, you're phenomenally welcome here. You and the way that you think and the way that you, you feel and the way that you do these things, there is such thing as recognizing here's what Christ has in store for you and here's what his umbrella of obedience looks like. But shoot, what a great question to go. So, so if God's telling me this is what obedience is and why can't I force myself into this category so that I can express myself sexually while remaining obedient, I feel like that is that, that pinpoints the head of the problem that comes down when we have this conversation about sex and sexuality. And it's not just for the, the, the person, who, the same sex attracted. It's not just for the gay. It's not just for anyone who identifies as queer or by different or just not in the same vein that people express themselves, which is kind of what, what that word is beginning to express in our culture. But there's people here who just have singleness and they just desperately want someone to love and a freedom of expression and in the same category. The Bible has confined their sexuality to say until there's a proper context to do so. Like, so I, I don't think it's just one category of people or, or whatever, I think it's a lot more universal than we think, which I think next week will kind of help us segue into that conversation. So I want to I wanna pray over our time tonight. It's for a lot of you, especially as we're starting to look at this model of like addiction or we're talking about like serial dating or all those other things. Um, I want to let you know something that if you really open up the text and you begin to ask the question, who is this Jesus character? What you'll find is that he interacts with people over and over again in the text that find themselves in situations that are scary similar to what we're experiencing today. And in every category and in every situation and in every circumstance, he leads with grace. He never lets go of truth, but he leads with grace every time. 
And if you're sitting here and you're saying, I think I'm too far gone for God to love someone like me, or I think I've gone too far for God to ever redeem me, it's like God's favorite thing to do. Like if God had a thing, you know, like you've got a thing, what's your thing? I play football, I play. God redeems things. That means he makes things that feel worthless and to be extremely valuable. And to recognize that there's not a single person in here who's a mistake. God is sovereign over all things and he brings all things together. In him we live and move and have our being. And so some of you, when we talk about pornography, you just feel so trapped in that all the time. But God didn't make a mistake in making you. We have, in some cases, chosen the way that is apart from God, and we find ourselves in bondage, but it is for freedom. Galatians 5 verse 1 says that Christ has set us free. So do not then return, it says, to the yoke of slavery that you were once found in, but find your true freedom in Christ. I want, I want you just to recognize that tonight might not be the beginning of that process for you, but I want you to know that there's hope. I want you to know that there's hope for everyone in this room who thinks, if you think, you're, if you think that you're too far gone, you are as close to Christ as you could possibly be because the people who are actually in some categories so far away from the cross are ones who think God would absolutely be delighted to have someone like me in his presence. Jesus consistently moved away from that heart and towards the brokenhearted who said, get away from me, I'm a sinner. Get away from me, you have nothing to do with me. All through, he called those people to follow him. He called them nearer to himself. He, he said at one point, I love this phrase, I didn't come for healthy people. I came for the sick. And so if you're like me and you've got a past that is riddled with expressions of things that are outside of God's confines of what it is, you're not the only one here. You're not in unique company you are amongst a body of people who love you and cherish you and think that your worth is in something bigger than what you find sexually arousing. That your identity is, is firm and secure in something bigger than just what turns you on or how you identify yourself in who or what you're attracted to. I think God's got a bigger plan for your life than to confine yourself for simply what you think is sexually arousing. And I think we'll find that to be true both in, in this conversation and heading into next week. And so if anything tonight brought conviction, that's from the Holy Spirit. If anything tonight brought shame, that's from Satan. Jesus doesn't even speak the language of, sin, of shame. He doesn't know how. God does not shame. The Holy Spirit might bring conviction and say, hey, I'm talking to you because I want you to be closer to me. But if you feel shame, that is from Satan. It's not from God. 8.1 Romans. There is no shame for those who are in Christ Jesus. I want that to just, just wash over you as you're feeling this. There's no shame for those in Christ Jesus, okay? There's no shame for those in Christ Jesus. I don't care what you've done. There is no shame for those who are in Christ Jesus. I don't care how far you've turned. There's no shame for those who are in Christ Jesus. The voice that you hear in your head that says, he's not talking about you because he doesn't know what you've done. I'm talking to you. There is no sin so great that you've outsinned the grace of the cross. Where your sin is deep, where my sin is deep, his grace is deeper still. There is no shame for those who are found in Christ Jesus. Would you pray with me? God, we surrender these things to you. And in some, it seems like in some categories of culture, historically speaking, it was difficult to surrender our finances to you. In some categories of culture, it was difficult to surrender morality to you, God. And it feels like in a sex-starved culture, the idea of surrendering our sexuality or our bodies over to you as a living sacrifice to say, God, <laughs> make me into something new it's kind of a crazy concept. But God, we're praying, we, we wanna live a different way. We wanna, we wanna breathe the fullness of the design that you've made for us. And we know that for a lot of us, it's gonna mean you're gonna have to change something in us, to take us, break us, mold us, shape us into something new. But God, at the end of the day, we wanna live a life different than what we're living. We wanna live a real one. So would you break down every stronghold that's been set up against us? Would you take every, help us take every thought captive for the sake of your gospel? Let us enrapture everything about who we think that we are in a little palm of our hand and then surrender it to you and say, God, take this and, and breathe something new here. We hand you all of it. Would you take our shame and replace it with the, the honor that only can come with being called a son or daughter of you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. <laughs>